topic, as you know, is Islamist movements uh, after the Arab awakening, uh, what they mean for the United States. And uh, the most current of observations uh, are affected uh, uh, under this topic. The, the broad question of uh, the meaning of the Arab awakening is with us. The very specific incidences of uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Egypt, uh, the rule of law within Egypt, are uh, on the minds of all of us. Nearly all of us are, are largely ignorant of that part of the world. Our guest tonight is a genuine expert, an authority on that. He's been working, studying, reading, and writing uh, about that uh, area for more than two decades, approaching three decades. Uh, in looking at what he has written, uh, things leap out at you. Of course, the theme of democratization, which moves and motivates and encourages so many Americans, is a major part of what he's looked at. Uh, the rule of law, uh, constitutions, the issues of whether those are applicable within the Islamist world uh, are huge questions, and they're very, very pointed uh, to the topic of the evening. Uh, if you were to want to talk about the immediate current events with anybody in the United States, uh, Professor Brown would be one of those you'd want to talk with this evening. And therefore, it's an enormous pleasure to uh, introduce to you Professor Nathan Brown. Um, thank you very much, and um, uh, thank you for having me up here to Baltimore. The, uh, it's an absolutely stunning setting, but it's also one that makes me nervous because I realize when I look at half of the audience, I don't know what the other half is doing. I am, however, used to uh, addressing a, an undergraduate audience in which about half the audience is asleep. So already I feel like um, not only is the crowd la large and apparently engaged from the amount of eye contact that I'm getting, but, a, but, but, but sort of a pleasant relief from that. Um, a note of apparent what will appear at first to be uh, self-promotion at the beginning beyond the very kind introduction that I was uh, given uh, already, but it's not a note of self-promotion. I am author of a book on Arab constitutional law that when it was written was reviewed, but the kindest review I got was, was by somebody who said, this is the best book in English on Arab constitutional law. <laughs> And yes, I think you've guessed it already. What he did not mention was that it was simultaneously the worst book. <laughs> and actually, it was a completely average book because I was the only person who'd ever thought of writing on the topic. And now, <laughs> now suddenly, it is actually front page news, not simply in Middle Eastern newspapers, as you might expect, but in American newspapers as well. And it's, besides the fact that suddenly very abstract questions, uh, believe me, my phone has been ringing off the hook to get questions about what specific legal terminology in Arabic means, many of which I cannot answer. Um, but it's an odd moment for the, tonight's topic in another way as well. Um, is, the United States has had a presence in the Middle East for quite some time. Islamist movements have been there for quite some time, but the two didn't necessarily mix very well. What we saw earlier this month was an extraordinary event, which I'm not sure the extent of which, uh, the extent of how unusual it was really sank in. We had, in the middle of an important uh, foreign policy trip while the president was trying to re-pivot towards Asia, not simply the Middle East grabbing headlines, but the Secretary of State leaving in order to mediate in the Middle East dispute. And who was it that she, what was it that she was going to do? She was going basically to oversee negotiations with Hamas, an organization which the United States does not negotiate with. She was going to oversee the negotiations. And not only was she going to oversee the negotiations, but she, because she could not talk to Hamas directly, she was going to do it through a close American partner in the region, President Mohammed Morsi of Egypt of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is the sort of thing that would have been unimaginable um, uh, really, even just a couple years ago, actually, it, probably Mohammed Morsi himself did not imagine being in this position as of even, even 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 one year ago. What I want to do today is to sort of shed some light on how we got there, and and perhaps 
a little bit less light because the future is a little bit dim right now, but a little bit of light on where we're going to go. And so a lot of what I'm going to do today is reflect first on Islamist movement, not the American policy part, uh, because Amer in America, presumably we know fairly well, but a little bit more first on Islamist movement, how it is that they became so political, um, how it is that they got involved in the Arab uprisings and so on, and how they've acted since. And then I'll try to integrate in an American policy, uh, an American policy dimension. And if I talked about Islamist movements, say, even if three or four years ago, the ones that would have probably been on most people's minds would have been groups like Al-Qaeda. These are small, tight-knit groups that are uh, have earned a fame notoriety for their violence. But the kind of Islamist groups that I'm going to be talking about tonight, Islamist movements, right? Al-Qaeda is not a movement. Al-Qaeda is a small, dedicated uh, uh, or network. I'm going to be talking about larger mainstream movements, and I'm going to be focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm also going to be focusing specifically on Egypt, not simply because it's in the headline, because it's, but it's the Islamist movement and the political system that I've studied the most closely. So it's the one that I know the best. But I'm happy to talk about comparable movements in other, uh, uh, especially in other Arab states, in, in, in the... Um, a question and answer period, if, if you would like. So what I'm going to try to do to, this evening is to set myself sort of four tasks. Number one, what are Islamist movements and how do they get involved in politics? Number two, how is it that they got involved in the uh, Arab uprisings of 2011? Uh, third, how have they behaved since then in, and what kind of challenges do they pose for the post-revolutionary environment? And then fourth and finally, what challenges do they pose for the United States? So let me begin, begin first, and, and, and this will probably be the most extensive part of my talk, just a little introduction to Islamist movements, and especially the Muslim Brotherhood and what other Islamist movements within the region often refer to as the mother movement, the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt, the one that placed Mohammed Morsi in the presidency and that seems to be at the center of regional and, uh, 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 and, and Egyptian politics today. The Muslim Brotherhood as a movement was founded in 1928 by a school teacher, not by a, not, not by a religious scholar, but by a school teacher who was himself very, uh, very religious. And what he wanted to do was to found a new kind of movement that would um, 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 uh, raise a new generation of Muslims to be essentially better Muslims. And I'd like to stop you when I'm introducing the Muslim Brotherhood and ask a question which nobody has ever gotten the answer to right. And the question is this, all the people guess all the time and make good guesses. Does anybody happen to know what the slogan of the Muslim Brotherhood is? Anybody want to guess? If I were asking this question to an audience in the Middle East, I would get an immediate answer. And the immediate answer would be this, Islam is a solution. Okay? And the reason why is that that is the slogan under which they have run in elections, basically since the 1980s. When Hamas ran in an election in, 19, in 2006, they adopted that slogan to reform as a solution. They, were, they, they ran under the, 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 the banner of the party of change and reform. But Islam is a solution. I just, they don't tell you what the problem is, it's, but it's, they just tell you what the solution is. And, and that, that quickly and, and easily uh, communicates the message. But it's not the official motto of the movement. If you take a look at the movement's emblem, there's another motto on it. And that is, and you've heard it before, be prepared. <laughs> it's there. It's right there in the middle of the movement. There's a Quran, there's two cross swords, and underneath the word be prepared. What is be prepared? Why is it that the Muslim Brotherhood is plagiarizing the Boy Scouts? Well, first, they don't think they are. Actually, the word appears in the Quran, and, and it's an injunction for believers to basically prepare themselves to defend the faith. But the resemblance with the scouts is not accidental. Because remember when I said this organization was founded in 1928. The founder of the organization, Hassan al-Banna, an Egyptian school teacher in a provincial city in the Suez Canal Zone, was very aware of scouting. And he said, essentially, I want to do something like that. And there were other kinds of scouting organizations that were, uh, that were being built in Egypt at the same time. But he says, I want to do something even bigger. I don't want to just organize teenage boys. I want to organize an entire society, a new generation, people in their teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. And from the very beginning of the organization, what it has been about, if you stopped and asked any member of the Muslim Brotherhood, what is the purpose of your organization? And you would be surprised at what the answer would be. You would expect the answer to be something related to Islam, and sometimes it is. But the word that appears even more frequently when you ask this question is reform. Well, that prompts a logical follow-up question. Reform of what? 
like reform of the society, reform of the political system, reform of the educational system, reform of religion, reform of your, your personality, your family life. Reform of what? And the answer usually is yes. <laughs> okay? We want to fix everything. We want to essentially rebuild the individual, the family, the society, the political system, and everything on Islamic lines. There is a, 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 if you re open up any book in Arabic on the Muslim Brotherhood, it almost always starts with the same quotation from Hassan al-Banna, where he says, something to the effect of, uh, and he's talking to an, uh, a convention of Muslim brothers, he says, we are not a political party, we're not a youth group, we're not a brotherhood, uh, a, a religious brotherhood, uh, we're not a charitable association, we're not an educational in, uh, in, endeavor or any of those things, we are all of those things. And what that meant, essentially, was that what he wanted to do was to form a comprehensive organization. Like I say, like the Boy Scouts, but bigger. Bigger in scope and bigger in who it would organize. And from the beginning, what he hit upon was a very uh, strong organizational model. You don't drop in the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? You join it, and as a probationary member, you, you, you are formed in sort of a small cell called a family. Um, you're kind of tested before you're kind of recruited. Then you serve as a few years kind of probationary members. And what this has the effect of doing is forming a tight-knit bond among a sort of small groups that are then arranged hierarchically in an organizational form that has proved extremely resilient. And not only has it proved extremely resilient, it has a little bit of the organizational characteristic of what I would say is a little bit like a toothpaste tube, right? Because it's got a very strong uh, uh, sort of, sort of uh, um, I guess, overall content that's holding it all inside. But it also means that because its focus is so broad, you squeeze in one area and it just goes out, comes out somewhere else. So that what that means is, in areas in in times at which certain fields of its act, preferred activities are closed, um, it can it can start doing uh, other things. I'll go to the neighboring example of Hamas for a minute. In the late 1990s, when it looked like there was a viable peace process, basically what Hamas did was essentially go underground in its political activities, not completely. Um, and certainly um, its, vol its violent activities cut down an awful lot and began to go much more into charitable and social work. That ended in 2000 with the eruption of the Intifada. The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood kind of followed the same patterns. What it meant to have an organization like this that could command large numbers of people and very loyal, with this very strong bonds of loyalty, was that in a political system that, wa that had elections, and Egypt in the 20s and 30s and 40s had elections, it was a very attractive political constituency. And remember, their, com their focus is comprehensive. So in the 19th, it begins essentially much more as a social organization, but by the 1930s, they're beginning to get sucked into politics by politicians who say it'd be useful to have the Muslim Brotherhood on our side, in the same way as a politician might say it's useful to have a labor union on our side, it's useful to have the National Rifle Association on our side, they've got lots of members and this sort of thing. The Muslim Brotherhood would be, would, it would be great to pull them in, and the Muslim Brotherhood isn't necessarily reluctant about getting in because it sees politics as a legitimate part of its mission. It becomes more active in the 1940s, and the 1940s was a period in which Egyptian politics became increasingly unstable, in which new groups tried to enter the political system, in which new uh, issues arose. Um, the British were still a presence in Egypt, and there became a very strong nationalist uh, urge to push them out. Um, there was a brewing conflict in neighboring Palestine over the uh, creation of the State of Israel, and the Brotherhood saw these as legitimately Islamic causes, right? We're occupied by non-Islamic power. There are Muslim brothers in Palestine who are, who, who are being treated uh, un unfairly, and the Brotherhood began to organize what it called a special apparatus, essentially a paramilitary wing. Um, in order to train Egyptians, uh, young Egyptians, not simply in, 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 in uh, scouting, but also in essentially preparing them uh, to fight guerrilla war. Um, the Egyptian government looked upon this, and this was a time when it still was recognizably democratic in some way. It was sort of a monarchy, but with an elected parliament, and they began to get very, very nervous. The Muslim Brotherhood wasn't the only group that was doing it. There were other groups who were forming paramilitary groups as well, but the Brotherhood was the largest and most powerful. And so the government, during the 1948 war over the creation of the State of Israel, banned the Brotherhood said this is essentially we're in a position of martial law. We can't have armed groups operating. We can't have groups like this that are going to basically be, you know, organizing citizens on a voluntary basis to go fight in a war. This is a matter of high policy. We can't permit this. They ban the organization. And the prime minister who signed the order banning the organization was assassinated, presumably by the Muslim Brotherhood. The Egyptian police reacted by assassinating Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the movement. 
this was, in a sense, a crisis period for the Brotherhood because a part of its activities, essentially the, the paramilitary wing, the special apparatus, the violent wing, was now driving the movement. Yes. The police did what? Assassinated Hassan al-Banna, the leader, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the first, yeah, the first founder is de yeah dies in, uh, um, uh, in, in basically assassinated. Um, in there's a new regime change in Egypt in 1952. A new regime comes in with military coup um, that initially seems to be favorably inclined to the Brotherhood. A lot of the military officers who took over power in Egypt in 1952 had passed through kind of a pro Brotherhood phase in their youth. But this group, which turned out to be very, very, essentially to build, to want to build an authoritarian regime, and the Brotherhood did not fit in these plans. So the Brotherhood, so the regime came down very hard on the Brotherhood, executing some leaders, exiling others, throwing large numbers in jail, um, torturing others. From the in the 1950s and 1960s, the brother, there was an effort to systematically root the Brotherhood out of Egyptian political life, not simply ban them formally, but actually enforce that ban in the most brutal possible way. And the Brotherhood at this point doesn't really know how to react. And in fact, since they don't have a choice as to how to react, they are driven underground. Um, they're driven into jail. And the leaders of the Brotherhood begin to, to, to figure out what is it that we are supposed to do. One very influential thinker within the Brotherhood says essentially what we've got to face the fact is that what we were always talking about was reform. The period for reform is over. This is a government that we cannot reform. This is a government that has led Egyptian society not simply in, impressive, in, 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 in building an oppressive political system, but one that has fundamentally left the boundaries of, of, of an Islamic regime. This is no longer Islamic in nature, and it is therefore a legitimate target for rebellion. Um, the argument that he made, this is a, a side quote, a very influential thinker within the Brotherhood, was actually a little bit more complicated than that. But that was, but the, the essence essentially was that the natural state between the, between good Muslims and the Egyptian government was a state of war. He was executed. The bulk of the Brotherhood, however, looked at that argument and said, you're taking this a little bit too far. It is not the job of individual Muslims to, ju to judge the sincerity of other Muslims. Um, despite our d oppressive circumstances, our oppressed circumstances, we should still carry on on the path of reform. Then you have a transition in Egyptian politics in the 1970s, and a very interesting transition, because the, 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 the political system that I'm d talking about that existed in Egypt in the 1950s and 1960s was very sharply authoritarian. There was only one legal political party. That party owned all the newspapers. It controlled broadcasting. This was a standard authoritarian system. 1970, Anwar Sadat succeeds Gamal Abdel Nasser, who had been the leader of Egypt. So and, and, and Anwar Sadat basically loosened up a little bit. He took this the sole political party and he let it, it let different factions kind of hive off of it. He allowed new political parties to form. He actually tried to put forward not simply these revolutionary credentials and socialist credentials like Nasser had done, but what he did was try to present himself as what was referred to as the believing president. He was going to be more religious. He was going to be a good Muslim. Um, um, and that sort of thing. And as part of that project, what he did was to allow Brotherhood members out of jail and to allow exiles to return and to allow the Brotherhood to reemerge. And he also, on Egyptian college campuses where there was an awful lot of opposition to the regime, he thought, you know, it might not be bad to allow Islamic religious groups to kind of rise up and attract these youths away from these radical ideas. Uh, this was, again, early 1970s when there are radical Egyptian youth who are trying to emulate youth movements elsewhere. And Sadat says, why, why can't they get religious instead? So what happened in the 1970s was you had the old leadership of the Brotherhood, this, the, the, the wing that rejected the side cut of violent path, essentially have an opportunity. And you had a group of college youth who get real, real interested in Islam. And in the late 70s and early 80s, these two trends meet, merge. And what the Brotherhood manages to do is to attract this new blood into the movement and refound itself and reestablish itself in Egyptian political life. Now, I said that what this was was kind of a reversal of the long-standing authoritarian or deeply entrenched authoritarian regime. And one of the aspects of this that happened during the Sadat period and during the Mubarak period was, as I said, an allowance for multiple political parties to form. And, and for the Brotherhood, what that meant was, wait a second, we can be not simply re-emerging and attracting college youth over to the religious path. We can be not simply trying to 
um, uh, sponsor orphanages and, and, and educational activities and so forth and so on. What we can also do is actually get involved in po politics. There are going to be parliamentary elections. We could run candidates. What about maybe forming a Muslim Brotherhood political party? Well, the, 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 the rules of Egyptian politics during that period were, in a sense, very, very clear. The rules of Egyptian politics under the Sudat and Mubarak presidency was to potential political opposition. You're welcome, if you want, to complain about the regime. You're welcome to have meetings as long as they're not too big. Okay, you're welcome to publish party newspapers as long as they don't go too far. What's too far? Well, we'll tell you when you cross that boundary. Okay? <laughs> and when it came to elections, there was a very, very simple rule of Egyptian politics during the period, to, a very simple rule that was communicated to the opposition. Um, and the rule was two words, you lose. Okay? You're welcome to run. You're welcome to form political parties. You're welcome to, form, to have candidates. You're welcome to get on national TV and, and, and put posters up and that sort of thing and have electoral propaganda. But the minute we think you are getting too close to actually running to win is the moment that we shut you down. Now, a lot of politi political actors were happy to play this game because it, it was an improvement over the past. The Brotherhood, however, was a special challenge because if the Brotherhood was going to run, it had the capability to mobilize not simply a few armchair intellectuals in Cairo and Alexandria, but it had a potential national constituency. It had reemerged during this period. And so the Brotherhood nev n was never allowed to form a political party. And the Brotherhood basically got this message. And they hated it. They were unhappy about it. But they essentially said, OK, we will play by those rules. No, we will not try to form a political party. The man who is currently head of the Freedom and Justice Party, the Muslim Brotherhood political party formed after the Egyptian Revolution, I interviewed him back in 2010. And I said, you know, what is your position on forming a political party? And what he said was the following. He said, in principle, we have decided that we should form a political party when the opportunity arises. I said, well, when will the opportunity arise? Are you thinking about doing it anytime soon? He said, if we did it now, the party application form would be our death warrant. We would be, the regime would come down on us so hard if we communicated that. What they were willing to do, essentially, was, as I, as I suggest, to, 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 to run to lose. If you interviewed people, me members of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and asked them, how many seats are you planning to contest in the next parliamentary elections, you would receive a consistent answer. No more than 30%. We don't want more than that. Because if we did, if we even tried to, the regime would come down so hard on us. Even if we got, say, one-third of the seats in parliament, we would have a sufficient votes in order to block any constitutional amendment. So that's the upper limit. No matter what, we will, we're not seeking political power, and we're communicating to the regime that we accept that. Now, there's an interesting question. Why would you ever want to run under these circumstances? My hunch is if you, if you went to the uh, whatever uh, office, uh, overseas elections in whatever place you live, and had to sign a form if you, if you filed for office saying, I agree to lose, you'd have many fewer applicants. For, for, for to get on the ballot. So what was the Brotherhood thinking? Well, what it was thinking was, again, back to its mission. It is a comprehensive movement, and it, it finds itself, or it sees itself, as cultivating a wide variety of skills among its members. That means that they, that, that, um, they should be able to do educational activity, charitable activity, and they want to have people who are politically skilled as well. So they don't, they regard... They regarded politics as a little bit of an educational experience. They regarded it as well as a place where they could have sometimes a little bit more space to get their message out. No, they could never pass a law in the parliament, but they could introduce one. And what they could do is get on the nightly news, because the, the sessions uh, of the parliament were a digest of them, was, 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 was televised nightly. The portion in which Muslim Brotherhood members of the parliament were speaking was generally edited very uh, tightly down, but they could still be basically up there questioning ministers about, about alleged corruption within their ministries, pl uh, um, um, pl pledging this kind of reform, showing a... Um, 
an interest in educational issues, and they could reach constituents as well. I had a uh, an Egyptian friend who lived in a district who, uh, which was represented by the Muslim Brotherhood. He he was had an enormous amount of respect for his uh, for his member of parliament. And I said, uh, oh, so 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 you're pro Muslim Brotherhood? He said, no, I can't stand them. Well, why do you like this guy? Well, when my daughter graduated at the top of her class in middle school, we got an immediate letter from this guy. Okay, so just constituent service was what they were very strong on. And in a society in which the political elite was seen by most people as being very self-serving and in which political office was viewed very, very cynically as a way to make connections, here were people that seemed to be in, in it for something larger than their own personal interests. And the Brotherhood was able to communicate that message. So in a sense, you could say semi-authoritarian politics of the kind that I'm describing was one that was almost made for the Brotherhood, this toothpaste tube organization. It was opening up the political sphere just a little bit, but enough for the Brotherhood to get something out of it and to get what it wanted. And what it meant, by the way, was that other political parties that were actually focusing only on the politics began to wither, right? How many people are you going to be able to attract to your movement or to your political party if you're a left-wing party or a right-wing party or this party or that party by saying, we want you to go out and really work with the voters and so on. And by the way, we know no matter what we'll do, we'll lose. You can't do it. So these parties actually began to wither. The Brotherhood, however, was able to say to its followers, look, we know we're not going to win, but there's other things that we can do, and you're going to get some kind of valuable skills um, that will help you in other aspects of the Brotherhood mission. So we're calling on you as a member of the Brotherhood because you seem to be able to speak well or you seem to have a talent for advertising. Can you help design electoral propaganda and this sort of thing? And they were able to attract people and, and to sort of deploy their resources to the extent that the political sphere was open. So that's what the Brotherhood was doing. And what it resulted in was a kind of cat and mouse game between the regime and the Brotherhood, where the Brotherhood was always trying to figure out how many seats are we going to be allowed to win and then run for no more than that. And the regime was always trying to communicate to the Brotherhood, don't step too far. And sometimes it would, this would take the form, it is rumored, I don't know if it's true, of explicit negotiations where they would sit down with the security service say, how, okay, how many seats are you going to let us win? And, okay, and, and, but other times it was more kind of implicit negotiations. In um, 2005, when the Brotherhood figured that it could win, um, that it could, would be allowed to win about a quarter of seats, um, uh, or 20 to 25 percent of the seats they contested. They ran hard for those seats. And for a variety of reasons, these elections um, were carried out over three stages. But the first stage was extremely free. And the Brotherhood did incredibly well. At this point, the regime began to panic, and it began to basically crack down. I don't know how many of you remember the 2005 parliamentary elections in Egypt, but if you, um, if you Google them, you'll find very quickly some pictures in which Egyptian security forces are surrounding polling stations, not in order to protect them, but to prevent voters from getting there. They wanted to make sure as clearly as possible that the Brotherhood was cut down to size. And after the election, when the Brotherhood actually sat and had one-fifth of the seats in parliament, um, what, the, what, what, the, what they'd calculated they would, they would be able to get, the regime said, this is going a little bit too far. And they began to crack down on the Brotherhood, and they began, interestingly enough, not by cracking down on the politicians within the movement, but on some of the people who were doing other things. And the message that they were trying to give the Brotherhood was very, very clear. You've overstepped your bounds. Little politics is okay. You've taken this too seriously. And because you've taken it too seriously, you're going to pay in the other parts of the toothpaste tube. Get out of politics, and perhaps we will think about letting up on your business activities, your social activities, your charitable activities, and so forth and so on. Um, the, and that was the state of the organization in uh, 2010. The organization was one which had showed its political prowess and had paid a very high price for it. In internal Brotherhood elections in 2010, what happened as a result was that those people within the organization who said, you know, politics is nice, but let's not go crazy. Let's withdraw a little bit. There's other kinds of things that we can do. We have basically provoked the regime, and it's time to withdraw a little bit into our own ranks those people began to take over control of the organization. And, the, and, and you know, the, um, the general guide, the successor for Hassan al who founded the movement, is called, his position is called the general guide. The current general guide of the movement, um, uh, uh, elected in 2010, the man who is the face of the movement, 
who commands the movement, has one very interesting characteristic. He's shy. Okay? He doesn't like to talk in public. He will if he has to. But this was basically an organ the organization's clear message is that the kind of skills that we want to cultivate right now in this dark period in Egyptian life are um, much more internal and inward-looking in nature. Politics is closed. We realize we went too far. In 2010, I, in December 2010, a couple months before the revolution, I interviewed a leading member of the Muslim Brother who had been a leading, one of the leading, most active parliamentarians. And I asked him, I said, you know, what's so, you know, start the conversation, what's it like these days? These are the worst days Egypt has witnessed in its history. Okay, well, kind of a bummer way to start the conversation. So I said, well, what happens? When a young member of the Brotherhood comes to you and says, essentially revives this radical argument from the past, who says, this regime has con gone too far. It is time to move against it with force. We tried the ballot box. It didn't work. Let's move to the bullet. What do you say to them? And he said, we would hear such voices among some of our young members, and uh, we tell them. What I tell them is this. I said, okay, you say you want democracy in Egypt, fine. Are you democratic in your family life? How often do you raise your voice at home? Okay. How do you treat your friends? Work on that first. And when you're a perfect Democrat in your personal life, then come back and we'll work on democracy in Egypt. Okay? Um, and if they don't listen, we basically edge them out of the movement. This was the Brotherhood in 2010. Now, let me move to the, the, the revolution. January 25th, 2011, a group of Egyptian opposition movements decide to call on demonst for demonstrations, a day of demonstrations, uh, all across the country. And they have no idea what kind of turnout. They think maybe they'll get several hundred, maybe even a few thousands. And they go to the Brotherhood, and they essentially say this, look, we can, we want to basically have wall-to-wall -wall opposition. We go to the old opposition movements. These are mostly young activists. We go to the old opposition movements, kind of the political parties that formed over the previous 20 years, and they are just dried up. They have no energy. Um, you know, they are busy running in parliamentary elections that are fixed. We've decided not to go that route. We're going to, to demonstrate to try and, and force the regime to make some changes. And if you join us, if the Brotherhood joins us, we won't have just a few thousand. We will have tens, even hundreds of thousands, because you've got that much loyalty in Egyptian society. And the Brotherhood at this point is feeling enormously pressured, and some of its own young members begin to say, hey, wait a second, you know, my leftist friend is going to demonstrate. Why can't I demonstrate? And so the Brotherhood reacts in classic Brotherhood fashion. They know that this is a critical moment for the regime. They also know that if they miscalculate, the organization itself could be threatened. And so what they say is the following. No, the Bro Muslim Brotherhood will not participate in January 25th demonstrations as a movement. Individual members of the Brotherhood are free to do what they like. And the youth, a strong youth movement within the Brotherhood and a few senior leaders took this as an opportunity to say, okay, we're in. And what happened on January 25th stunned the organizers. They had huge demonstrations. And the regime didn't know how to react. And it panicked. And it tried to figure out what to do. And after three or four days of mounting demonstrations, in which the regime seemed to be basically losing its grip, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership probably took a gamble. And this is an organization where its leaders do not like to gamble. They said, OK, we're going all in. Um, we're supporting what they now began to call the revolution. But in a sense, only after testing the waters first. And their calculation was essentially, look, we're going to get blamed for this no matter what. Why not just join them? So they joined the revolution, and they successfully brought down, um, brought down the regime. And then there was a problem. What to do afterwards? Because it was clear what they were rebelling against. Okay, the Egyptian revolution had a slogan that was one word, go. Okay, so Mubarak went. Then what were they going to do? It was a special problem for the Brotherhood itself because remember the organization that I described. This is an organization that is a tightly knit group of uh, individuals who are dedicated to a single mission. And it, it is an organization that is, as a result, very, very resilient, and it operates very well 
under the semi-authoritarian conditions that I talked about. But all of a sudden, it's not semi-authoritarian anymore. All of a sudden, they can do things like form a political party. All of a sudden, po the political field is wide open to them. One of the leading members of the Muslim Brotherhood famously gave a talk to young Brotherhood members in the, uh, about a couple months after the revolution, in which he said to them something to the effect of, you know, look, don't forget that your brother is first and revolutionary is second. He said, in fact, you should basically be living most of your life within a Brotherhood context. Your friends should be members of the Brotherhood. You should marry within the movement. Okay? Now think of an American politician who's trying to run for public office, who starts instructing his followers, by the way, you shouldn't have anything to do with the other side. You, you should make sure that you never want to marry a spouse who's a Republican or a Democrat or anything like that. That's not how political parties operate. They try to, especially if they're running for office, where they want 50% plus one of the vote, they try to pull people in. And this was somebody who was basically saying the organization comes above victory. This was an organization that was not really used to thinking in political terms. They knew that they wanted to form a political party. They knew there would be elections. They knew they'd do well in elections. But they also thought, wait a second, if we, you know, what happens when you run in elections? Well, perhaps you win them, and then what do you do? <laughs> perhaps you basically see the organization slowly sucked into politics. Our mission, we like to think in terms of generations. Politicians think of the next election. What we're going to be doing is creating an organization that will suck the energy out of the movement and put it to short-term political purposes. So yes, we will form a political party, but we'll keep a separate distinct movement, and we'll have that political party follow the old path of not trying too hard to win the election. And that's what they did in, uh, in 2011. And then things change a little bit. And this is where I want to talk about kind of how it is that the, uh, the, why the current moment is, is such a challenge. The Brotherhood began not simply running and not simply doing well, it began winning. And it got sucked into this in a series of incremental decisions that I, I traveled to Egypt off and on during this period, and I talked to some people in the Brotherhood, and I could see the transformation within the organization. Because in, in early 2011, they were very, very clear, even to mid-2011, they were very, very clear they didn't want to uh, win and govern Egypt. They wanted a role in governing Egypt. What they wanted most of all would be a coalition government with other political forces in which they would be able to kind of dip their toe in the water, but also be uh, ensure that the entire movement n did not get sucked into politics. So in, 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 in what happened in 2011 was they just said, okay, we're going to run for 30% of the seats. And then 30% kind of um, inched up to 40%. And then, then they formed a coalition. And they said, okay, we don't want to run ourselves. Again, we want a coalition government, so let's form a coalition with other political parties. And that coalition won about 46% of the seats in the parliament. And no, they're just short of majority. They're not necessarily running the country. But then they're sitting in the parliament. And they, what they discover is the other 54% of the parliament is made up of people who can't organize. A bunch of independents, a bunch of small political parties. And that means that 46% is essentially enough to dominate the body. The body will do whatever they want it to do. They're in control of the parliament. They're beginning to run Egypt. They're beginning to think, well, wait a second. Maybe we want this ministry and that ministry. Maybe we want this law and that law. Um, I talked to one of the, basically the head legal advisor in January 2011 before the parliament met. And he had this binder full of draft laws that they were going to produce in the parliament to show that the Muslim Brotherhood was different and better than everybody else. And then they discovered something. There was a military that was still there. And the cabinet was not responsible to the parliament. And no law would be passed that the military didn't agree to. So they won this parliament, and people were looking at them with tremendous expectation, and they had no power. They pulled the levers and nothing happened. They wrote bills, had the parliament discuss this and that, and nothing happened. And they began to be a little bit of a laughing stock. And they pressed real hard on the military. You've got to get out of politics. You've got to at least reform a cabinet that, 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 that uh, is responsive to the parliament and that sort of thing. We need some parliamentary, we need some cabinet positions. And the military said, no, 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 no. And by the way, if you continue to complain like this, don't forget that there's a lawsuit against the parliament, and actually the parliament might be dissolved by the constitutional court. Brotherhood took that as a threat and said, okay, we are basically tricked here. We were, we, everybody thinks we're responsible, but we're not. 
So the Brotherhood had pledged for a year after the revolution, we will not seek the presidency. We don't want that. We'd like somebody above politics. We want to, we want to back somebody for the presidency that we trust. They don't even have to be an Islamist. But we're not going to run for that office. And when they hear, hear that, they said, OK, we're changing our mind. We're going for broke. We're going for the presidency. And the Brotherhood, remember, is, an, is again, a disciplined and uh, organization that is probably the only political actor in Egypt that shows any sense of strategy. So they did something very, very smart. Nobody knew what the rules of the presidential game were and how they would be enforced, so they filed not simply one candidate for the presidency, but two, in case one gets disqualified, the other's in, right? So the first choice gets disqualified, and the man that they referred to as the spare tire is elected president of Egypt in June of 2012. Um, there's no parliament, um, the, uh, and, and the military is still in control. And in August, basically, he reshuffles the military high command and ushers them out of politics, um, at least out of day-to-day -day politics in most areas, and takes full legislative authority in the absence of parliament. That's Mohamed Morsi. Uh, the current president of Egypt. It, and, you know, they said this is just a temporary measure. We're still interested in the constitutional process. And let me say just a few words about the constitutional process. The rules of the Egyptian transition were written in a fit of absent-mindedness in February and March 2011. And there's a lot of speculation about how these rules were written and why they were written. I'm not sure that there's any good explanation. But one of the things that they had was a provision in which um, the uh, parliament would elect 100 people to draft a constitution, which would then be presented to a referendum. It's sort of a strange procedure. I got to interview the man who actually drafted this procedure. I said, where did you come up with this idea? He said, oh, I found it on the internet. <laughs> So that's where it came from. But, the, but it served the Brotherhood very well because, remember, they, ha they basically had a majority in Parliament. Or not a majority, but as, uh, essentially a working control of the Parliament. So they basically elected 100 people. They had some opposition people in there, but they made sure that it was safely in Islamist hands, and that body get, got to work. It was supposed to be done by December 12th. And what has happened over the last couple of weeks in Egypt is that all sorts of things have been happening. They tried to make all kinds of concessions in the content of the document, in procedures on how it would be discussed, in order to make sure that the opposition, the non-Islamist opposition, would remain within the body. And that began to break, break apart over the last few weeks. And people started walking out, boycotting, withdrawing, and so forth and mm. so on. Not only that, there's a lawsuit against the Constituent Assembly, the body that's writing this document. And the Brotherhood began, I think once again, to panic. And it began to see, hey, wait a second, we've seen this movie before. This is what happened with the parliament. We're given the presidency, we're given the constitutional assembly, and then the judiciary comes in and throws the whole thing back to square zero, and we have to start all over again. This is a process that is stacked against us, and that explains Morsi's Thanksgiving Day surprise of deciding that he was going to issue a, a, a constitutional declaration on his own authority that basically immunized his own actions and immunized those of the Constitutional Assembly um, uh, from um, uh, parliamentary oversight, uh, from judicial oversight. So now I get to the current challenge for Egypt. My sense is that um, Egypt right now faces a very severe immediate crisis and I don't know how they were go they're going to get out of it. They've g basically got a very deeply polarized uh, political process and political, uh, 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 political environment in which you have two sides that are digging themselves in very, very deeply and cutting off routes of retreat. You have the Islamists and the presidency on the one side, and you have a lot of the institutions of the state, especially the, the, the judiciary, and most non-Islamist forces on the other. You're not the first person who said that to me. Yes. You have on the one side the presidency and Islamists. The institution of the presidency, headed by Mohammed Morsi the, from the Muslim Brotherhood, and Islamists. They're on one side of this. And they're backing the presidency. They're backing uh, um, uh, the constitution that's being drafted and so on. And on the other side, you have the judiciary, which is saying the law is not just what the president says it is. Um, and you have all non-Islamist political forces in the country. The, these groups that have never been able to coordinate among themselves, but they're now managing to rally around opposition to Mohamed Morsi. Um, essentially, what I see is at the root of Egypt's political crisis is the fact 
that the brotherhood is too strong for Egypt's good and for its own good. You have no real viable electoral opposition. That means people don't trust democracy. I should say the brotherhood trusts democracy because they know anytime voters go to the polls, they seem to wind up on top. But the opposition is not convinced, or is convinced essentially that, that, that what the brotherhood is doing is using its majority in order to ram through whatever it wants. And my sense, therefore, is you will not have a viable political system in Egypt until the opposition begins to be able to feel the credible electoral uh, presence. And they're focusing right now on combating the president rather than on winning the next election. So you have a very unhealthy and short-term political environment. The interesting thing, however, is that you've got a challenge, I think, for the Brotherhood as well. It has basically, by a series of small steps, found itself kind of grasping onto political power for its own life. It said a year ago it was never going to get in this position. And that's where they are. It is a challenge for the movement because what it means is that the movement itself doesn't really, is begun to forget all that comprehensive goals, okay? I talked to a leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood who had not gone over to the political party, who had stayed out of politics. Um, this was a, a, a January of this year, and I asked him, what is the Brotherhood doing outside of politics? You had all these plans after the revolution. You could do whatever you wanted. You could form youth clubs. There was, there was talk of a Muslim Brotherhood soccer league. You were going to form labor unions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing? And he just looked at me, and he sighed, and he said, you know, it's just very hard. Okay? The energy has been sucked out of the movement and has gone into politics. And so the Brotherhood has basically, I think, dug itself into a trench which it has trouble extricating itself out of. Now, I said at the end what I would do is talk a little bit about the challenge for the United States. And here's the interesting thing. Short term, it seems to be much less of a challenge than you would think. And this was very clear, again, over the last uh, year. What happened with both the Brotherhood and the United States was they basically tried to figure out, okay, the United States figures out this movement is there and we're going to have to deal with them. What is it that we want to hear from them? And the Brotherhood takes a look at the United States and says, you know, what the United States thinks matters in the world. So what do they need to hear from us and can we say it? And it basically boiled down to a couple things. Peace treaty with Israel. And probably something having to do with democracy or human rights. Okay? So the Brotherhood says, okay, democracy, no problem. We win all elections. You can have that. Human rights, well, you'll see that in the constitutional process. And peace treaty with Israel, well, that was hard. That was very hard. And I noticed something about the Brotherhood. Remember, this is a disciplined organization. It may not be a surprise to you that the Muslim Brotherhood is not all that fond of Israel. Well, what were they going to do? This was a core ideological commitment, but it was also clear it was their ticket to respectability. So they ironed out a position internally, and it goes something like this. The Brotherhood has a position as a movement, but it also understands that Egypt is a state and states have international obligations. We will not break of any of Egypt's international obligations, including the peace treaty with Israel. And the interesting thing about that formula was when I interviewed people in, from the Brotherhood after they worked it out, which was about a year ago, I noticed something. They all said almost the exact same words, but their body language differed. Some of them, these words just rolled off a tongue. It was the easiest thing in the world for them to say. And for some of them, it was like talking to somebody in the middle of root canal surgery. Okay? <laughs> the you know, we will respect Egypt's international obligations. They were almost in physical pain as they said it, but they said it. And so this is, the United States right now is in an oddly familiar position in Egypt of dealing with a president who seems to be overreaching a little bit politically and yet has just proved his tremendous usefulness internationally. What are they going to do? In a sense, the same dilemma that they had with the Mubarak regime has recreated itself. My sense is that the appropriate long-term response is clear. If Egypt is, and it may still be, developing into a democratic system, there's ways we deal with democratic societies, right? There's ways we deal with Europe and Japan and Israel and so forth and so on. And that is you don't build up relations with one person. You build up relations with institutions. You reach out both to government and opposition. 
right? When foreign leaders come here, they would regularly deal with not simply with the executive branch, but with the legislative branch. And it's time to th start thinking of Egypt in those terms, as a, as a country with many political actors, all of which we need to have good relations with, or at least be able to have contact with, explain the American position, and learn what they're about. That's the transition that we have to make. The problem is that doing it in the short term, when they're pressing security problems in the area, is very hard. And the, dif the, the difficulty also is that Egyptians just aren't used to this. You may be surprised to learn that if you were to go to Egypt today and move, m meet with somebody who's not from the Muslim Brotherhood, maybe their first political question would be, why did the United States give Egypt to the Muslim Brotherhood? You may not be aware that that happened, but there are Egyptians who believe it, that the United States fixed the election so that Mohamed Morsi would become president. Um, and so even an even-handed approach by the United States becomes one in which various political actors say you're favoring the other side too much. The long-term way to deal with that challenge, as I say, is clear. But I suspect that Egypt and the United States are going to be in for a little bit of a hairy ride until those details get worked out. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. The floor is now open for questions, sir. Uh, the, yeah, so the question is, is the army still a potent force, and where do they stand on the spectrum? Here's my sense. The army in Egypt is a little bit of a closed society, right? I mean, um, um, actually, that's one of Egypt's problems is there's a lot of little societies within a big one. And so, you know, if you're in the army, you're raised within, a mili within an army career, you go to army clubs. I mean, you're basically kind of isolated from the society. It's clear that what the army wants is to protect that position. They don't necessarily want, and this was what I think people missed over the last year, they don't want to be collecting the trash. They don't want to be collect, uh, uh, running the schools. And they don't want every single political problem in the country to be laid on their doorstep. They, want, they do want out of politics so long as they can control the sphere which they really care about, which is military and security affairs and their own internal operations. And I think what happened in August after Morsi was elected was that he essentially cut a deal with the military. Whether it was explicit or not, I don't know. But it was essentially, you leave politics to me and I will leave you alone and I will protect you. Morsi has, for instance, come down or the, the regime has come down very hard on politicians or journalists who criticize the military too much or call for trials of military leaders. So that's the kind of deal. And it's one that I think the military is essentially happy with right now. The real question is, right now you have, today you had huge demonstrations in, in Cairo and across Egypt against Morsi. Tomorrow you may be having rival demonstrations by the Muslim Brotherhood. That's not clear whether they'll go ahead with them or not. If you have a steadily escalating situation, will the military be able to stay out of politics? My guess is that the officers who run the military right now would greatly prefer not to step in. They had enough of that. Um, um, over, over the last year and a half. But if there were a serious threat of civil disorder in Egypt, you could see a return by the military. So where do, the, where do the descriptions of the Brotherhood as radical terrorists come from? Uh, to some extent, they come from the Brotherhood's own past, right? Because this is a movement. You can trace a line between Hassan al-Banna, you know, the founder of the movement, and, and um, uh, um, Osama bin Laden. I don't know why his name blinked for me for a while. But, but um, it's not a direct line, but essentially this, this argument that I talked about in the, the radical strain of the Brotherhood that was born in prison and torture in the 1950s and 1960s, is not part of the Brotherhood anymore for the most part, but it didn't die. It left the Brotherhood and, and, and inspired movements elsewhere. Um, so that's part of it. Um, part of it is also an argument, I think, that says that when you have Islamist movements like this arising, they provide a protective umbrella for even more radical groups. So the Brotherhood itself, maybe we can deal with them, but what, what happened? So you know, essentially, some of the same su suspicion that would have been of socialist movements during the Cold War. Well, socialist movements, you know, from an American perspective, might have been a little bit, you know, crazy in some countries, but the real concern is, are they going to try and form some sort of broad go unity government with the communists and this sort of thing? So I think that's where it comes from. And then, and, 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 and underlying this as well is, I think, just um, a general concern that any time you have Islamist movements, they probably have an anti-American agenda. And the Brotherhood, I mean, the, 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 the Brotherhood is not a movement, I, I don't think they're harshly anti-American all the time, but they do not have an agenda that is all that friendly to the United States. They've got a view of regional politics in the Middle East that is um, 
um, that is very different from the American view, and a cultural suspicion of the United States that I think is very strong. I mean, one re- I will tell you one thing interesting about Mohammed Morsi, who's the president of Egypt, okay? He is somebody of the Brotherhood leaders who spent more time in the United States than anyplace else, than anybody else in the movement, he, or anybody else in the top leadership. He got his PhD in California. He taught at uh, Cal State, uh, I can't remember, Cal State Fullerton. I can't remember, in engineering for several years. And so you expect when you meet him, I mean, his English is fluent, uh, but you expect when you meet him to meet somebody who's partly Americanized. What I noticed, there was an interview that Mohammed Morsi gave a couple months ago to the New York Times, and what was stunning about the interview to me was that he managed to show the kind of the, the visceral Mohammed Morsi. He cannot talk about the United States, it seems to me, for more than 10 minutes without mentioning one American institution that my guess is barely familiar to some people in this room, and that's Hooters. Okay? <laughs> It's a cultural anti-American. It's just, we don't want that in Egypt. So there's a very strong cultural conservatism which expresses itself as anti-Americanism, which is, in Morsi, it's very, very strong. I've met him a, a couple times, and I noticed that Hooters does not leave the conversation. And it's kind of, you know, I, 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 I want to tell him, look, you know, I've never actually been in this restaurant, and, and, and my reaction might be the same as yours. I don't know. But, but, but so there's, there's that as well. So I think, you know, this is not, this is not radical, it's not um, terrorist, but it is one that is extremely culturally conservative um, and certainly in an American context would be seen as extre- on the extreme right. You, what, you know, so the question is, what about the area of law and Sharia? I wish you'd ask that as a first question because I'd like to give a 20-minute answer, but I have a feeling by the time that I was done, you'd be the last person remaining. Um, here's the thing about you, you have to begin with Sharia. Sharia literally means kind of Islamic way. It's the Islamic Sharia, the Islamic way of doing things. It's something that has a very positive resonance. So you would have very few people in Egypt who would say they're against Sharia. You poll the Egyptian population, like 90% say Sharia is great, and the rest are probably Christian. The question is, what do you mean by Sharia? And so the question for me is, what's the Muslim Brotherhood's image of Sharia? What do they actually want to implement? And here's what they, they say, and here's what I think their behavior is. They definitely want to draw on Islamic teachings in making public policy. They also, however, want essentially an Islam that a society that becomes more Islamic from below by peaceful persuasion. So that's kind of their their emphasis. So when it comes to their legislative agenda, if you do things like read their platform, if you look at the laws that they drafted in Parliament, if you looked at 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 at, at the the legislative agenda when they were actually dominating the Parliament, it focuses on other issues. They wouldn't they, on a few times they'll come up to something where their conception of Sharia makes them do something. Some, uh, informs what they're doing in a very specific legal realm. But the interesting thing is, for instance, the first law that they worked on in the parliament, the first major law, that they, piece of legislation that they were going to bring to the plenary um, was an NGO law, a law basically liberalizing non-governmental organization, liberalizing civil society. It had nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with um, um, anything of, of, about the religious agenda. So yes, they want a religious society. Yes, they want one in which religion, religious teaching informs uh, um, uh, a public life. They don't necessarily want it enforced immediately on a minute level. What I like to say is that the kind of Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood wants to see is a little bit more familiar than you might think. It's like the America my father was born into, okay, which banned alcohol banned commerce on Sunday, banned artistic expression that was deemed offensive to public morals, okay? These were the sorts of things that it did. And it was always a democratic society, but it was one in which the will of the majority was culturally extremely conservative and enforced that on the rest of the population. And that's the Brotherhood's image, I think, of democracy and of Islamic law. Up until that last observation. The, uh, the worst part of what I do is having to uh, suggest that it's the end of the evening. I know there are enormous amounts of, of questions left. Um, this has been an extraordinarily interesting evening, and I wish we had time to go on. I've looked at uh, uh, the titles of innumerable things you've written. Nearly every one is fascinating. It would be, be wonderful to have a chance to read them all. This has been a good evening for us. We thank you very much. Thank you.